And good afternoon. Welcome to the Mercatus Center. Today, we're going to talk about making sense out of the dollar and the effects of a weak United States dollar. With us today, we have Dr. Ann Kruger, the Johns Hopkins University, the School of Advanced International Studies. Before that, she's previously worked as chief economist at the World Bank and was also a deputy managing director and interim director of the IMF. She has published numerous books and articles and edited books as well on the topic of the global economy, developing economies, and as a little side, for those of you who might know of the term rent seeking, it is something that she coined. So I don't know if, you, if you're an econ buff, uh, it's pretty cool, I think. Other than that, um, before you, you have some uh, blue forms or surveys. Uh, we appreciate your feedback so that we can always work to uh, improve our courses that we offer for you. And also, if you'd like to join us in two weeks, the first week of March, we're going to have a course on antitrust. So if you'd please join me in welcoming Dr. Kruger. Okay, thanks. Is that better? Okay, good. Didn't sound right, but I presumed that nobody was protesting, so it was okay. <laughs> okay, uh, let me start with the exchange rate then. And we'll start just with a simple definition, which is that the exchange rate is the price of one unit of a foreign currency in terms of another. Okay, uh, so that for example, if a pound costs two dollars, the price of a pound is two dollars. If the, if the pound appreciates, the price of a pound will go up, i.e. it will be $2.40, $2.80. If the price of a pound goes down, the dollar appreciates relative to the pound. Uh, it's amazing how much confusion comes from that simple definition, but there's an obvious reason for it. If the price of the dollar is going up in terms of pounds, the price of the pound is going down in terms of dollars. And people talk about an exchange rate going up. Well, until they say which way it is, it doesn't make sense, and you see it all the time. <coughs> so a first thing is to be a little bit clear as to the price of what in terms of what. And I like normally, instead of talking about exchange rate, uh, to talk about the price of a unit of foreign exchange. And I'll try and do that the price of foreign currency. I'll do that until it's completely obvious, as it will be later on. But I'm talking about the dollar, US dollar, and what the, its relation to foreign currencies is. All right, now, of course, uh, it's $1.47 per euro. And it, uh, the way it's quoted, it's $1 per 108 yen. But that says the price of 100 yen is 93 cents. So you, you be careful because the pound is always quoted one way and many other currencies the other, which adds to the confusion which is already there. Uh, basically, you need to be careful with all this. And even as I talk, I will try to be explicit. But if I'm not, please ask me immediately. So that's an exchange rate. It's the price of one currency in terms of another. In that sense, it's not a real concept. It's the price of one money in terms of another money. But there are really two concepts that matter a bit, one of which is the nominal exchange rate, which I just talked about. And the other is the real exchange rate. Now, the real exchange rate is basically the price of our currency, their currency in terms of ours deflated by our price level relative to theirs. Okay, so if our 
if our currency, if, if our dollar does not have any inflation at all, and the Chinese have, let's say, 10% inflation, then in real terms, the Chinese currency is cheaper for us because we're, you know, pay less. And the appreciation or depreciation becomes through the changes in the price level. And one of the things I'll assert now and come back to only very briefly later on is that in general, if a country is trying to hold its nominal exchange rate against the forces of supply and demand, which we'll come to in a minute, when that is happening, in general, the result will be inflation if it should appreciate or deflation if it should depreciate. And the point about that is that there will be real appreciation or real <coughs> depreciation, depending on which way it goes, and that that's just a counterpart to what isn't happening on the nominal side. And very often, in fact, in many circumstances, uh, it isn't true that a co government can fix its real exchange rate. It is only true it can fix its nominal exchange rate. And <coughs> within a very short period of time, uh, that w if it fixes the nominal exchange rate, then the price level will adjust to get to the, quote, right real exchange rate. It can make a difference for a few months. But over a period of two or three years, real exchange rates go where they want to go. And how you get there is simply a matter of the policy choice. It is not a matter of whether you get there. It's how. Uh, so we, we want the nominal and we want the real. And for most purposes, uh, it will be the real that matters, uh, at least on current account. And so when folks are talking about China, they are talking about real, not nominal. And until last year, China had less inflation than the United States. So when the Chinese were holding the nominal exchange rate, pretty close to holding, they let it appreciate about 8%. But the infl inflation differential was more than that. So when that was happening, the Chinese were actually depreciating a bit because they were making their currency cheaper in real terms, not nominal, but real. So it's careful to dis be careful to distinguish these because they matter. OK. Uh, for the euro, dollar, the pound, the yen, couple and a lot of minor currencies, a couple of other major currencies. Uh, in recent years, we've had floating exchange rates, which is to say that the price of foreign exchange, like any other price, is market determined. The Japanese did intervene a little bit in their foreign exchange market in, I think the last time was either 2004 or 2005, but about then they did intervene. Since then, they have not. The United States has not intervened in its market for years. Uh, the, the British seem to leave theirs alone. The, Euro, uh, the Euro ECB leaves the European currency alone. So for the most part, in this today's world, the major currencies, are, prices are market determined. They are not determined by government directly. Now, indirectly is another matter, uh, because what de for determines it, of course, is the demand and the supply for foreign exchange. And the demand and supply for foreign exchange, of course, is a function of various things that happen domestically. If one country has a more rapid rate of economic growth than another, the chances are that its demand for imports will grow more rapidly than the other. If the demand for imports grows more rapidly, the demand for foreign exchange to finance the imports will grow more rapidly. And if all else is equal, which of course it never is, you would then get depreciation of the currency of the more rapidly growing country in real terms. Just because they want more from us and we don't want any more from them right now because we haven't grown. Uh, and so they're going to have to have some depreciation, i.e. the price to them of our goods is going to have to go up a bit. Okay? What's the demand for foreign exchange? Well, it comes from two components. One, current goods and services, and the other, capital account transactions. And here's where all the action comes. On current account, the demand for foreign exchange comes from imports, from tourism. When our people want to go overseas in the United States, then they want foreign exchange in order to pay for their goods and services overseas other kinds of current transactions for goods and services. Insofar as there are foreign owners of American companies and their dividends or interest paid to them because they own those assets, those foreigners then want to repatriate those, assets, those, those income and dividend streams. They will want to buy pounds or euros or whatever it is. That's a demand for foreign exchange. So if, in fact, our the foreign ownership of our assets increases, and if the rate of dividend or interest remains the same, the amount of demand for foreign exchange 
for that purpose will increase, i.e. the demand curve will shift, and uh, if all else is equal, there would be some depreciation in the dollar. On the other hand, foreigners also want more American assets, and as they want more, uh, they, they're going to be earning greater returns, and they'll want more, and if the two shifts are about equal, then of course you get no change whatsoever. There are some things like workers' remittances that are regarded as current account even though they're not income transactions, but the current account of the balance of payments is effectively all the demand for foreign exchange and all the supply of foreign exchange on current income basis. Okay. Now, that means it's double entry because, of course, exports are uh, something where we get foreign exchange, imports are something where we pay foreign exchange, and if, in fact, there were no capital account transactions and just exports and imports, and if it so happened that the value of exports was equal to the value of imports, the demand for foreign exchange, supply of foreign exchange would just equal out, be no problem in the markets. Now suppose that you've got a few capital account transactions as, for example, the United States wants to buy some um, European securities. Now there has to be some kind of a way for the United States to get more foreign exchange, the demand for foreign exchange on the part of the U.S. has gone up, so the dollar has to depreciate a little bit or something else has to happen, right? Capital account transactions are asset transactions. And since people in this world are not all that altruistic, almost by definition, capital account will be the negative of the current account. If people buy goods and services from us, they want to be paid. And they're, they're either then going to hold dollars, which is they're acquiring a foreign asset, or they're going to buy or they're going to sell their foreign exchange in order to get their own currency. Either way, it's a capital account transaction. Okay? So the capital account balance is in effect, balance is the net acquisition of foreign assets, and I mean net foreign assets less the net disposal of domestic assets in the international community. I'm going quickly through this, but the main idea is that uh, if, if we want to buy assets overseas, we need to have money. But on the other hand, uh, if we acquire foreign exchange because we export it, we have to do something with it. And you're not going to want to hold very many pounds or euros for very long unless there's some other reason to, in which case you want to convert them into dollars. And that's why whatever happens on the current account, if there's an imbalance, i.e., exports of goods and services and other current account transactions are not equal to imports of goods and services and other account transactions, then there will be a capital account, negative or positive, which will reflect the net change in assets held by us or by foreigners. So when we have a positive capital account, we're acquiring assets abroad, okay? And to do that, we have to have a foreign exchange, so we have to have a current, a current account surplus, and vice versa. All right, so having said that, uh, basically, the capital account is a negative of the current account. There is, in the balance of payments, always an errors and omissions. And there are some other complications uh, that are relatively unimportant, so I'm skipping over them here. Uh, but it's pretty close to true. Uh, that uh, Conceptually, it's true by definition. Now, another way of saying that, or another view of this, is that in a closed economy, or in an economy where they force imports to be equal to exports somehow, and there have been such economies, then it, investment by the private sector and by the government will equal savings by the private sector and the government. Okay? In an open economy, there's a difference. Investment minus savings is going to equal the capital account balance, negative. So when the United States has more investment than savings, as it has had for some years, we're going to be basically selling assets to foreigners, which is a positive capital account, because they're giving us, or we're getting the money, so to speak, from that. And the uh, negative side of that is that we're going to have a current account on the other side of it, all right? They have to be offsetting to each other. So our current account deficit is our capital account surplus, and our capital account surplus is what the assets that we've sold to foreigners Net what, they, net what we've bought. So it's a net figure, not a gross figure. And most of the fuss is about these very simple concepts. But notice something. It's very important. Since the current, since the capital account, sorry, since the capital account is the difference between investment and savings, 
you're not going to change anything very much unless some re for some reason the investment saving balance changes. Right? Uh, it doesn't matter what you do. Saving and investment aren't going to change. You're not going to change the current account imbalance unless you decide you're going to have capital controls or something. And they are so costly that in the modern world, nobody is seriously thinking about that. So I'm going to leave it aside. So the saving, difference between saving and investment is the current account deficit. Um, okay. If all else is unchanged, country A has no inflation, while B has 10% inflation, the real exchange rate to remain, we should probably remain unchanged. In that case, country B is going to have its currency in nominal terms depreciate 10%, right? Because there's no real change in demand. People want just as many automobiles as before. They're going to sell as many airplane engines. But since inflation has been 10%, their prices are higher by that much. Therefore, their currency has to depreciate because our price level is stable. And so in order to have the system in balance, there's going to be a 10% depreciation of the currency that, uh, that has more inflation. Now, if nothing else is going on, you would expect that that would be the only reason for nominal exchange rate changes would be inflation. But the real exchange rate itself, which is what's important, can change for a number of other reasons. It can change, for example, because your country, not the United States, but another country, and other countries' real exchange rate can change because, for example, there was discovery of oil. So they have a lot more they're going to export, and that great deal more that they're going to export is going to give them more foreign exchange, so their supply of foreign exchange increases. Therefore, their, their currency will appreciate because until something flows through, there won't be anything on the other side. All, just think in terms of supply and demand, and when the supply increases of the foreign currency, uh, then we have an appreciation when demand for foreign currency increases, it's depreciation. It's the same, in that sense, it's the same as any other commodity, only it's a monetary phenomenon. <coughs> but now, I think you can understand why I said I was a little uncomfortable with the notion of a weak exchange rate, because I don't know what it is. What I know is that there's a price of foreign exchange out there, and I know that it will change in response to market pressures. But what those market pressures are, I've got to identify. <coughs> And I don't know uh, what's what, so to speak. Now, as I said, until last year, the Chinese inflation was below the US inflation. So there was real dollar appreciation. And that is that a strong dollar? Everybody's been saying that they think the Chinese currency should appreciate. If it did, would that make it a weak dollar? No. Somehow or other, we've got some confusions here terminologically that really cloud the discussion, and they're important. Do we want to have a strong dollar vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese? Not according to what I read in the press, uh, the statements made from senators and congressmen. They want a weaker dollar with respect to the Chinese yuan. Uh, and as I say, I don't think that makes, makes much sense to talk about strong or weak. Uh, if, if the dollar is whatever it is today, and tomorrow the demand for dollars shifts up more than the supply, then the dollar will appreciate between today and tomorrow. Does that make it stronger or weaker or anything else? I don't know. It does make it more appreciated tomorrow than today, uh, but that's a different story. Okay. That was dry economics one. We're now going to go to dry economics two. <laughs> no other way to get there. Okay. With an open capital account, which all industrial countries have and now many developing countries, there's really a policy triangle. You can fix the exchange rate, say that we are going to hold the dollar at uh, 1.5 euros or whatever, or $1.5 dollars per euro, <coughs> or we can, uh, and, and we can fix it, but then we've got to adjust monetary and fiscal policy so that our balance, current account balance and our overall balance internationally makes sense. Okay? We cannot forever run an ever-increasing deficit or surplus for that matter, and something's got to fix it. Not today or tomorrow, but over the longer term, and in that sense, uh, basically, policymakers have a choice. If they want a fixed exchange rate, then they're going to have to let their monetary and fiscal policy adjust. And to some extent, it will just almost automatically. If there's a surplus of exports over imports, as for example in China, <coughs> the Chinese central bank has to receive the dollars that are and other currencies that are turned into it. It has to issue yuan in exchange. That increases the money supply. 
<coughs> to some extent, they can take off sending action, but not too much. And that's where the inflationary pressure in China is coming from. They have fought it as hard as they can, as long as they can. And as you probably saw, the inflation in China is up to 7%. And since people aren't hedged, 7% there is probably more painful than 10 or 12% here it would be here. Okay. So you cannot have an independent, decide what you would like for monetary and fiscal policy on domestic grounds, and then say, and we will fix the exchange rate and pay no attention to it. Until 1973, the world was on a fixed exchange rate system under the so-called then Bretton Woods system. And what happened is when countries tried to maintain their exchange rates, one of two things happened. Either there was a domestic recession, as they were trying to obscure their quote, current account deficit or whatever it was, total deficit, by means of uh, basically tighter monetary and fiscal policy, or there was a run on the currency. And one of the interesting things about fixed exchange rates, when you try and maintain a rate, is everybody can see whether you're in surplus or whether you're in deficit. And because when you're in fixed exchange rate, the authorities have to meet the demand for foreign exchange, right? And so when there's a deficit, as American citizens are walking to their banks and they're saying, please, we want to buy pounds. And the central government has to supply the pounds and they could go to the international market, sell some gold and get the pounds. But what's happening in the process is that monetary policy is affected. Okay, so the inflationary pressure will come about either through the appreciation, or will be offset by appreciation of the exchange rate, or it won't be offset, in which case you will get domestic inflation, when otherwise there are pressures for appreciation. The opposite is true for <coughs> depreciation. Okay. <coughs> the monetary fiscal mix can affect, in the short run, the exchange rate. <coughs> How does it do that? If somehow they decide to tighten up monetary policy and loosen fiscal policy, the interest rate will rise, right? As the interest rate rises, foreigners will want to buy more domestic assets. That increases the demand for foreign exchange, at least in the short run. And that means <coughs> that we will get an exchange rate change. But notice that once they bought those assets, we then have to pay interest on those assets. And as the interest bill mounts, things are going to happen over time. And that's a very shortened version of what happens in debt crises. Basically, there comes a point where everybody can see that the country is trying to hold its exchange rate. This was Thailand, for example, in 98, 97, whenever it was. Uh, everybody's trying to hold the exchange rate. Meanwhile, they knew that there was a current account deficit. They knew the currency couldn't possibly appreciate, therefore. Therefore, it might depreciate or it might stay the same. Well, when you've got a one-sided bet, do you take it or do you leave it? Everybody takes it. When everybody takes it, then the money flows out and that forces exactly what the authorities are trying to avoid. Until 1973, that happened in many industrial countries. There were several balance of payments crises in England, by which I mean people were betting that the pound would depreciate. And as they did so, uh, then there was an outflow, and it did. Uh, we certainly had France a couple of times. We had Japan. I mean, there were a number of countries. Japan fought it off, but they had it, uh, <coughs> that had that sort of thing. And it wasn't until 73 that the industrial countries have moved away from that. Many developing countries kept more fixed exchange rates, some still have, including arguably China, although they had about 8% appreciation in nominal terms over the past three or four years. Uh, but the countries that have had their fixed exchange rates have given people a one-sided bet, as Thailand did, uh, and as some of the other Asian countries did, and that was part of the reason for the Asian crisis. Uh, you just can't do that. Uh, and one of the remarkable things historically is that we avoid many of the crises by moving away from that. As you probably know, until 19, well, after the Second World War, the U.S. economy was the strongest in the world by a huge multiple of what it is now. Uh, I, I tried to check the number this morning, couldn't, but by memory, the U.S. Had, was estimated to be producing 43% of the world's GDP in 1945-46. And it had... 80 or 90 percent of the world's gold reserves. Everybody else had paid everything to the U.S. because they wanted to get their war material. The U.S. was producing its productive capacity had not been destroyed. <coughs> so it was a strong, healthy economy. And for a while, nobody worried about uh, U.S. deficits on current account 
Everybody wanted dollars. There was a so-called dollar shortage, believe it or not, given what we talk about in the world now. And nobody worried about U.S. current account deficits uh, as they were trying to build up some foreign exchange reserves. And the dollar was, and I quote, as good as gold, which was allegedly the underpinning of the, cur of the currency. But in fact, dollars and gold were interchangeable. Everybody thought they were wonderful. Well, over the years, countries did build up foreign exchange reserves. And in particular, they were buying U.S. treasuries. U.S. Treasuries don't yield a very high rate of interest. And, of course, what they were doing was getting this good as gold asset. But basically, by about 1971, 72, with the inflation at the end of the Vietnam War, <coughs> at a much accelerated rate at which uh, people were getting U.S. dollar-denominated assets, people began saying, hey, the dollar can't hold. And the U.S. abandoned the gold uh, fix by na and the Bretton Woods system and let the dollar float by 1973. That has to have been one of the luckier accidents in economic history. Because in the fall of 73 is when the OPEC countries decided that they were going to withhold their supply of oil. And it's very difficult to think what the world would have done had we at that time still been on a fixed exchange rate system. In fact, fluctuating exchange rates made a huge difference and made the adjustment much easier than it otherwise would have been. <clears throat> Some of the countries that were oil exporters were able to appreciate their currencies, so let their currencies appreciate. Some of the ones that were oil importers were able to let their currencies depreciate. That enabled banks in the, uh, in the financial centers to lend to the developing countries that were oil importers. And the whole process, while not smooth, was a lot smoother than it would have been. So that was lucky. And after that, we have had a world in which uh, fixed rates were gone. Uh, for the major currencies, and uh, that there have been fluctuations as needed. Now, given that we're so worried about this weak dollar in the title, I did just take down, and from my sources, the uh, Council of Economic Advisors economic report of the president, so this is very official, uh, the trade-weighted real value of the U.S. dollar, trade-weighted across major currencies at various years, from 1973, where 1973 is 100, okay? So by 1985, it was 122, i.e. it appreciated 22% between 73 and 85. By 1988, it was 84, 122 to 84. So it had depreciated over 30%. It reached a P, sorry, it, yeah, it depreciated to its maximum level of 81 by 1996. That was when it reached its peak back. By 2000, it was back to 105. By 2002, it was 111. Then once again, 2005, 91, 2007, 87. Is the dollar strong or weak? And when? It fluctuates. Other country currencies fluctuate. The real appreciation after 1996, and I'll focus on that, was accompanied by several things. And there were several causes. One was, in the late 1990s, the U.S. economy was growing very rapidly through productivity growth. There's productivity growth that was so rapid. Everybody wanted our goods and all of that. But that, in turn, led to a large and growing current account deficit. So in the 1990s, we were getting falling domestic savings as a result of several things. Net domestic savings in the U.S. was about 10% in the 1960s, 8 to 9% in the 1970s, 7 to 8% in the 1980s, 5 to 6% in the 1990s, and 1% or 2% in the past couple of years. U.S. domestic saving net has been very low. It reached its bottom in 2005. Now, the current account deficit rose from about $50 billion in the early 90s to $100 billion, sorry, in the early 80s, to $100 billion in the late 90s, to $260 billion by 1999, $762 billion in 2006. Now, what you need to do is go back and add up those figures each time it's a number of years, and you would get some indication of how much net foreign assets held in the United States increased over that period, and it's huge, right? Because every time we ran a current account deficit, foreigners were getting our assets. Net foreign asset position of the United States was positive until sometime in the 19, late 1970s. Uh, by 1999, it was minus 766 billion. By 201, minus 1.919 trillion. By 2006, two, minus 2.5 trillion. Negative U.S. assets, 
net are going up properly. We have, we have assets, but we also have liabilities. And the current account deficit is the net position, and it's the net position that is approximately reflected here. So we have net liabilities to the rest of the world of about two and a half trillion dollars against a GNP of 13.3. That's nothing contrasted with Lebanon, which right now has a net debt abroad of 186% of GDP, and other countries where they have absolutely unsustainable situations. But if we were to keep going on this trajectory, and there's no chance we will, quite clearly, it's some, the interest and dividend account would keep going up. And at some point, things would happen, including that at some point, foreigners would begin worrying and saying, hey, maybe the dollar isn't so safe. And if it isn't so safe, maybe we should get out of dollars and switch our holdings from dollars to other currencies. And that is, at least to a degree, a vulnerability. Now, we are not as vulnerable as Korea, Taiwan, other countries were. Why? Because we issue all of our debt in U.S. dollars. And if we're push came to the shove and worst came to worst, and it won't, don't let me scare you, but if it did, we can always print them because they're dollars. When Korea ran into its problems in 1997, it could not print dollars. It could print one, but nobody wanted them. So when you owe your debt in a foreign currency, it's much more serious than in your own currency, and the United States is unique in the world and to the extent that's true, although other industrial countries are increasingly issuing debt in their own currency denomination, and less so internationally, and even some developing countries are now beginning to try and sell local currency denominated debt internationally as they try and get away from this particular source of vulnerability. Well, granting that then, what happened and why do we have a current account deficit? Well, three factors contributed. Remember, it's the difference between saving and investment. We had a lot of investment because we had rapid productivity growth that needed lots of investment, and it, the United States was an attractive place to invest. So some money was coming in because they wanted U.S. dollar-denominated assets. <coughs> They've got them, but I mean they're still increasing them now. Secondly, the rest of the world was growing very slowly, so the rate of return on investing abroad was low. So once again, people were looking to the U.S. as a, a safe place. They looked to Australia and they looked to Canada too, but how much money could everybody invest in Australia and Canada? We're just a bigger market so we could absorb more of it. And of course, third, there was a very low savings rate here. So all three of these factors contributed, and during the early 2000s when this was being discussed, I just said as a rule of thumb, I'll give a, th a third of the current account deficit to each of the three things. Slow growth abroad, rapid growth and attractive investment alternatives here, low savings rate. Another way of saying it is, probably if you wanted to look at the situation and say, how should it unwind? How would you get back to a more sustainable trajectory? Probably the U.S. savings rate had to go up for about a third of it. Probably foreign economic growth had to go up for about a third. And probably if we kept on growing, that would be enough. We didn't have to get back to zero because we did have this more attractive place. Now, in fact, what happened was that the U.S. current account deficit peaked in, 19, in 2005 as a percent of GDP. In absolute amount, it seems to have peaked last year. It's falling again now, even in dollar terms. Uh, it was almost 7% of GDP at its peak and is now back to about 5.1. Guess what else? The U.S. fiscal deficit has fallen by about 3 percentage points of GDP. What is a fiscal deficit? It's negative government savings. And as the government negative saving has fallen, so to a degree has a current account deficit. Now it's not one for one for a whole variety of reasons. But in general when there's, you know, the saving is public plus private saving, investment is public pr plus private investment. Government saving was negative and large until a couple of years ago and it has fallen. And that has affected the current account deficit. So where we are now is that Nothing, no, no question, but that you could sustain for this year maybe, and probably will, a 5% current account deficit. Maybe next year, maybe the following year, but how many years can the rest of the world go on? We're a big country absorbing 5% of U.S. GDP assets in their countries year after year after year. It has, it, when people say it's unsustainable, this is what they meant. Alan Greenspan said it at the height of things. Everybody else has said it. Nobody has questioned that this could not go on forever. It can't. Now, Herb Stein, who is a very good economist and was ch chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, said, so what's to worry? That which is unsustainable will not be sustained. 
And uh, there's truth to it, but you can unwind unsustainable things with more or less pain. And that's, I think, where the concern is. Uh, the concern has been, and some economists feel much more strongly about this than others, and I'm one of the others, uh, but many, some economists really worry that at some point foreign governments will start quickly to try and get out of dollar-denominated assets. Should they start trying to do that quickly, you could have a reasonably rapid shift or rapid change in the dollar exchange rate for obvious reasons that we discussed. Demand for dollars has shifted down sharply. <coughs> Supply has gone up. You've got a problem. Um, <clears throat> it's not at all clear that's going to happen. It is the vulnerability that is there. It is probably a vulnerability. It is desirable to have somewhat reduced. If we have a current account deficit of 5 or 6 percent a year, well, we're growing at 2 to 3 percent a year, our debt relative to GDP is going to be up, debt meaning in all t types of assets, is going to be up about 4 percent a year. That doesn't work too well. It's still, as I said, only about 20 percent of GDP, but it will go up and up and up until uh, the current account deficit is below approximately uh, the rate of growth of GDP. That's where it's at. Uh, there are going to be four factors, I think, that will determine where the dollar goes. The first is the U.S. savings rate. Already, as I said, the federal government deficit is down, and that's an improvement in savings. That's the right word in savings. And there was a lot of this saving on the part of private households as they were borrowing against home equity to do home improvements and things like that. And at its peak, that home equity loans and other things in the housing market were equal to this saving of about 4% of GDP. That's gone down now to about 3% and probably will fall still further. So that's the second thing that will probably help the current account, move the current account deficit back to a more sustainable level. Uh, there may be some other things involved. On the other hand, uh, the second thing is U.S. growth vis-a-vis -vis that of the rest of the world and whether it's supply-driven, <coughs> i.e. good productivity, or whether it's demand-driven. The moment Japan's growth looks as if it's stalling a bit, uh, the euro area, which both Japan and European growth picked up quite a bit in 2005 and 2006, that also helped start reducing the U.S. current account deficit. This doesn't look quite as strong right now. Uh, that's going to matter, too, in terms of where we go from here. Uh, there is clearly a question of oil and its impact on the international economy and what's going to happen to that oil price. Uh, in a sense, an increase in the price of oil is like a tax on uh, the workers of the world, if you like, and the transfer of the rentiers, because the people who own the oil wells are rentiers in the Middle East and so on, and they do not have a need to spend it all very quickly, whereas the people who are paying the tax, i.e., those who are uh, buying the gasoline or the house heating, are basically likely to take a larger fraction of it out of consumption uh, or out of their income immediately and therefore reduce savings. Okay? So if the oil price goes up, it will offset some other things in interesting ways, but it would indeed, I think, be something that, on, that would not lead to current account improvement, except in so far as the U.S. is relatively better off than Japan and most of Western Europe. And that is a partial offset. Finally, the fourth question as to what's going to happen to the dollar exchange rate is quite clearly U.S. inflation <coughs> and, and fiscal and monetary policy. Some economists, I told you, are worried about the sudden crash of the dollar in case foreigners start uh, selling domestic assets. Others have other worries. One worry on the part of some, and again, I don't, well, I do share it a bit, but not terribly, is that the Fed may have gone or may go too far, and that combined with the fiscal stimulus could push up inflation. And yesterday's inflation numbers intensify that concern to some extent. If that happens uh, and the U.S. inflation goes up, then quite clearly the nominal exchange rate should depreciate somewhat to offset that in international markets because right now Japan's inflation is barely above zero. And uh, European inflation, is, the ECB target is 2%. Uh, UK target is 2%. We're already at 4 If we go up much more than that, that clearly will impact uh, the exchange rate. And notice that if for every year that the U.S. inflation rate is, let's say, two percentage points above that of its trading partners, there should be two percent nominal depreciation, all else equal. So that's not a once and for all, that's a continuing thing. Those things are going to matter. And all of those things are going to determine uh, the path of the dollar. And you might say, well, why don't we fix the dollar? Because then something else would go, and what would go first would be any latitude in monetary and fiscal policy with the current pressures uh, from the people say there's something likelihood of a recession 
If you had a fixed exchange rate, you'd be tying the hands of the authorities and you could not do the other things, at least not to the same extent. So the question really is not will there be correction. There is a correction going on. The question is how quickly will it happen? How much will it be orderly? How much of it will happen through these shifts in real demand and supply, oil prices, growth rates, etc.? And how much will have to be done through the exchange rate? The exchange rate has taken quite a bit so far. And leaving the exchange rate as the mechanism that's the shock absorber in the system is obviously desirable, seems to me. Uh, there are very few economists who would quarrel with that. So I think on those grounds alone, uh, things look reasonably OK. And the exchange rate is the wrong thing to worry about. The exchange rate reflects what's going on in the system. You can and should worry about the savings rate. You can and should worry about other things, uh, but not the exchange rate per se. It will be an outcome. Um, so paying attention to savings incentives is important for its own sake, but it's also important because the United States, like some other countries, only not necessarily quite so badly, faces a demographic transition. The baby boomers are about to retire, and they're just starting along about now. And that's going to mean a smaller labor force relative to the elderly plus the young population. That's going to mean bigger demands on Social Security and even more the health care system. And so public expenditure pressures are going to go up. And unless there's some saving in the system now, uh, the system will get much more difficult to manage in 10 or 15 years. So there's some very real reasons for worrying about saving, quite aside from the current account deficit. Uh, the other thing that's to worry about is the medium-term protectionist threat. There's absolutely no question but that uh, <coughs> the uh, <coughs> success in terms of economic growth over the past 60 years of the world economy is unprecedented. Do you realize that average income in real terms now is three times what it was at the end of World War II? Six or seven percent of Americans in 1900 would have been classified as not being poor by our current poverty level. Six or seven percent only. Ninety-three were below today's poverty line. That is how much living standards have increased. It's huge, monumental. And one of the major contributing factors has been the increasing flexibility of markets, and in particular, the increasing ability to trade across borders and take advantage of the international economy, both because of comparative advantage, but also because it provides competition and other advantages, too. The other thing that could go very wrong is trade relations, and in particular, protectionist pressures. I shudder at some of the things I hear, uh, and I'll come to one in particular in a moment, but the medium-term protectionist threat could be a real threat to the entire system and would then lead away from things that are desirable in terms of real living standards as well as other things. It's important. The shocking thing about everybody talking about protectionism in the same voice, breath as exchange rates is that the one other thing that all economists will agree on is that the level of employment is a macroeconomic phenomenon. It's determined by monetary and fiscal policy and, guess what, productivity. It's determined by the wage-setting mechanisms in the economy, and that's where it's at. Having flexible exchange rates helps that, but the underlying determinants are the underlying macro, fiscal, and, as I say, wage-setting mechanisms. The other night on TV, I happened to be on just at the point in the Wisconsin primary where they sent an exit poll, 70% of people in Wisconsin thought that they had lost jobs because of trade. Well, first off, there's no way that trade was ever anything like 70% of jobs. And Wisconsin is not a state that has the kinds of jobs that might have been lost, like textiles and clothing anyway. So what this is all about, I have no idea. But where the American people are at uh, and where the economics is are quite different, and it's scary if that then feeds into protectionism, because that could lead to a real turnaround in not very good ways for the international economy. And then none of us would care what the exchange rate was. That would be one way of solving that problem. So let me end there, because I know you want some time for questions. Can you please all join me in thanking Dr. Kruger? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I know a lot of you have to get back to your uh, rooms and everything. On your way out, could you please fill out the uh, blue form in front of you and hand it to Marianne at the door? And if there are any questions or answers, um, please wait for the microphone so that uh, we can mm -hmm. properly hear you. Are there any questions? I wanted to ask you a hypothetical question that might not be hypothetical. Let's say you're a, a Middle Eastern country that 
sells oil, mm -hmm. and you're accumulating lots of dollars because the, from the United States because we're importing a lot of oil. Number one, is, if, if, if their currency is tied to the dollar, isn't that going to cause inflation in that country? And secondly, will that country therefore not have an incentive to perhaps redominate the price of oil in terms of another currency, say the euro? And then the game changes for the United States in that rising oil prices and depreciating currency um, cause a you know, serious uh, uh, problem for the U.S. Uh, c economy, much less people who consume um, petroleum products, which is all of us. Well, there is no question but that uh, several of the Middle East producers are considering changing to a different basket of goods, including the dollar, because they're claiming that by denominating uh, oil price in dollars, what's happening is uh, that they're losing out as the dollar depreciates. Uh, if I had to bet, uh, which I'm glad I don't, uh, but if I did have to bet, I'd bet that if they do change, they'll change just as the dollar starts appreciating. Uh, which is the history of these kinds of shifts, almost invariably people wait until, you know, it's so clear and then by that time it's too late. Uh, but even if they do, those who hold large reserves, and that includes the Middle East countries, are very reluctant, they, they may shift their currency composition or acquisition of new assets, and they are shifting to some extent. They're very reluctant to shift the currency composition of their existing assets uh, for the obvious reason that they're the ones that would lose. The Chinese, you know, everybody worries about Western China. Well, the Chinese hold so many reserves. Guess who loses big time if the dollar depreciates because they start selling them off? So there is something of a too big to, in this case, sell off phenomenon that probably reduces that risk to a considerable extent. Uh, not making it zero, but I think considerable. And I think the other thing is there's no place really to go with your assets. Uh, you, Euro maybe, but the euro hasn't done that well. European growth hasn't been that great. Uh, if you had a chance to invest today in a representative basket of U.S. tradables or a European tradables, my, your continental European, my guess is you'd pick the U.S. Uh, and that's a big offset. The strength of the American economy is part of what's attracted this inflow and is part of, I think, what's going to protect it from a huge outflow. But it is one of the risks that people who are very concerned about the buildup of dollar assets do point to. Um, you said that uh, right now we have a very low savings rate and that coming up we're going to have a large population that's going to start actually taking out their savings and using it to live on as we go through the transition mm -hmm. where they go move out of the workplace. I guess my question is, if we have a low savings rate now and we know that in the next 10, 15 years we're going to have all these people retiring and converting their mm -hmm. 401ks and TSPs <coughs> into annuities and other things that are going to produce income for them over the mm -hmm. long term, then what's going to happen to our savings rate and how then will that affect our exchange rates, et cetera? Good question. Good question. One of the things there that makes it so complicated to analyze is that other countries that have the same demographic transition, as you may know, the Japanese population is already falling. The Japanese labor force is falling even faster. Uh, so whenever you see nominal, oh, and Japanese prices were falling a bit. So whenever you saw nominal GDP constant in Japan, it meant rising real GDP. Whenever you saw falling G real GDP just a bit, it was still rising per capita income and even more rapidly increasing worker productivity. Um, in the United States case, first off, we do have pay-go for Social Security. And the real problem here, and to a degree in Europe uh, and Japan, is that pay-as-you-go right now, I think the number is it's about five workers per retiree for Social Security. I think it's supposed to go to something like two. Well, can t are two workers going to take that rate of tax on their income and still have anything other than, when you talk about class war, age war, uh, between the, the elderly and the working population is a major concern. Uh, it's more that than the saving because you just cannot um, I mean, do that. And, and the pay-as-you-go means it's not really saving. It's a transfer right now. The 401ks are less of a concern in that regard. That's okay. Remember that as you have fewer workers, uh, the return on labor will go up and the return on capital will go down anyway. So that part's okay. Uh, the Europeans have more of a demographic problem than we do. The Japanese do. So how it plays out <coughs> in terms of exchange rates, I can't begin to think. That's, I think, the least of the concerns about it. Uh, the real concern is what happens to world economic growth and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, be a little more kind of flesh out the argument about how seventy percent of people in <coughs> excuse me seventy percent of people in Wisconsin blamed free trade on uh, on unemployment because I I think what they're trying to say is that uh, obviously Asia has comparative labor advantage also they have less stringent environmental restrictions and rising cost of oil if you're going to save money you know go where it's mm -hmm, cheapest mm -hmm. right as Max Weber said. Um, could you? Well, I, what, I, what I've heard him say was that in an exit poll, one of the questions was, uh, what do you think accounts for the, you know, do you believe that you have, the people have lost jobs because of trade? And the answer, 70% said yes. Now that's what I know because I wasn't there uh, and didn't do it. Uh, I think in general, as I read these things, uh, there is sort of, what should I say? tendency to blame trade because the other guy isn't there to defend himself. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons why the environment isn't better. And perhaps trade may or may not be one, but if it is one, it's, in my judgment, a small part of the entire reason, re if that. In fact, in general, there's not much evidence to support even that. But uh, all of these things, the difference between, and the reason, as I saw some numbers the other day, if you look at workers' real compensation at, let's say, the prices of 1990, They've gone up since then. But compensation includes health care, and health costs have gone up enormously. So you, if you took that into account, of course the take-home pay has not gone up because so much of it's gone into the health care sector. Now some of that is because there really is better health care, despite all of the, con the contrary. Uh, some things actually have saved lives, and we do have drugs and things we didn't have before. And so some of it's real, but it's costly. Some of it may, not, may or not be, and it may be fixable. But you know, it isn't trade. And yet trade somehow gets the blame largely, as I say, because it's a nice whipping boy when there's nobody there uh, to defend the other side of it. Now, in the case of Wisconsin, it's more puzzling because Wisconsin's mix of industries are a mix that are hev is heavily toward the export side. Uh, dairy is an exception, but I don't think anybody thinks about dairy in connection with trade. Uh, and except for that, if you think of Wisconsin production, you know, sort of the auto plants and stuff in the south, if they're not <coughs> the assembly and stuff, that's not the stuff that they're talking about. Um, <coughs> but many of those have been very successful exporters. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's why it's so puzzling. <coughs> because then, remember, the, the, in Wisconsin's not even a high unemployment state. That's what makes it so very puzzling and distressing. They believe it, but I don't think it's true. Yeah. Anybody? Even there, even there, even there, I would believe it less than the people. How much of Michigan's unemployment is attributable to the autos per se? And how much other things is the first question. The second question is how much trade. Uh, and one of the things that happened in autos is that there's been tremendous automation, which would have happened with or without trade. So the question of how much of it is trade is interesting in part because you've got to sort out what would have, suppose there'd been no trade at all. You still would have gotten much more automated uh, plants than you had 30 years ago. And quite clearly, you would have had employment in autos going down. Now, you've also had a reduction in the real price of cars. And for every additional car, in the, for every additional car, what is it? Of the employment in autos and related industries, service stations account for 70%. Uh, so with more cars, you have more service stations, you have more mechanics and what have you. Even there, I'm just not sure. Probably in Michigan State, I know Michigan auto employment went down, but whether when you take the indirect effects and all of that together, I just don't know, and I've never done the arithmetic to try and even begin to figure it out. But my guess is that you'd find probably 80% of Michigan's reduction was attributable to automation, and 20% to trade, if that. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on the, the Wisconsin examples that you would spoken about. I think the other thing to remember is that these people are being interviewed. Um, some of this is lagging, maybe lagging indicators. Wisconsin has had a huge down, down, downturn, at least within the Milwaukee economy and manufacturing over the last 30 years, probably since I was in kindergarten. There has been a steady downturn, and you can see the effects upon, for instance, the inner city in Milwaukee. Now, that's just a mm -hmm. small geographic part of the state. It's a big part of the population of the state. And the, so people remember that it was shifts in production that allowed their parent, their father, their uncle, mm -hmm. or even now themselves to be laid off. Yeah. And those shifts in production are very public. 
when a plant moves to Mexico or moves to Asia, it's very, very public. Other things that may occur in the economy are more subtle and don't come with a press release, and you don't, it's not clear what the forces at work, but that the shifts in production, which is, I think, probably what underlies that 70 percent number, uh, is a big deal in Wisconsin. And they have seen, they have seen losses, direct losses, direct shifts of production yeah. over the years, and they're, they're accustomed to that yeah. by now. I, I agree with you, but uh, let me tell you a little story. About 1976, I think, um, I was on the Committee for Economic Development Research Advisory Board. And about a week before their annual meeting where you met with the CEOs of the companies who were there, uh, there was an, a big, long two-day, two I think, article in the New York Times. And they talked about some factory in Newark that had closed down uh, because of the competition from trade. And this enterprising reporter was going and find out what, finding out what had happened to all these workers a year or two later. The following week, I ended up sitting next to the CEO of the whole company at lunch. And so I started, I was going to ask him some questions about the foreign trade impact, but fortunately before I could walk into it, <clears throat> I did say to him, um, oh, I read that article in the uh, paper last week about your closure of the Newark plant. He said, yeah, we moved south on account of how uh, there are no unions there. And the whole article in the paper had said it was because of trade. Now, if you were management and you were going to move to the south, would you tell them so? Uh, if you were management and you were incompetent in there, had to sh for had to shut down, would you tell them that or would you say foreign trade? Uh, one of the many things I think is forgotten is that if you didn't have some of the low value added stuff moving overseas and then being shipped back for assembly here, it is very unlikely that those firms could compete and then you'd lose those jobs. Uh, I don't think it's a simple, I mean, I think some of the jobs have been saved uh, by moving some of the low value added stuff that most Americans don't want to do anyway offshore. Now that says we need to do more in education, we need to do more in a lot of other things, but the argument that this is just jobs lost, uh, just to me was th that some people thought so, didn't surprise me that 70%, that's huge, amazed me. Thanks for coming, Dr. Kruger. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, that uh, real, um, Let's say if a country fixes its currency, the, uh, it may uh, fix the nominal mm -hmm. uh, exchange rate, but the real <coughs> exchange rate will change to mm -hmm. compensate for that. Um, what about when you factor in um, if the country is increasing its interest rates, um, such, as, um, such as what China is doing to try to tamp down their inflation um, and thereby try to you know, keep their currency um, low while keeping inflation low as well? well. First up, there's a limit to how much of that you can do. Secondly, the reason China is trying to maintain higher interest rates is in part because lots of Chinese want to get money out of China, and they're hoping that by holding the exchange rate, or sorry, the interest rate at a reasonably high level, people will be induced to continue holding you on and not try and have capital, uh, illegal capital outflows. And there are illegal capital outflows of fairly major proportions. Uh, the other thing, is, as I said, if if in fact you really should be doing something on the exchange rate side and you don't, it will show up. You can sterilize um, probably fairly 95% effectively in year one, probably 85% in year two, probably 70% in year three. And each year it goes on, it gets harder because people find more and more ways around it. And that's exactly what's happening in China. So yes, you can do it. Uh, but in a sense, you're putting off the day of reckoning and you are running a risk. Every day you wait that all of a sudden the floodgates will open and it will be a a strong, difficult move rather than a gradual and somewhat easier one. But yes, you can do it for a little while. Are there any more questions? We've solved all the problems. I think so. Okay, if you'd please join me in thanking Dr. Kruger again and everybody have a great day.